Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends, and opinions from normally a conservative perspective. However, this evening we're trying to be fair and balanced. Really? We have uh, members of both the Democrat and Republican parties on tap this evening to talk about the first year of the Trump presidency and their reactions. We have Sue Carroll representing the Republican side of the House and James Farley representing the Democrat side of the House. Both of them are personal friends, and so we are hoping that there's no hitting below the belt, there's no <laughs> the slapping around, and I think we're going to have a great conversation. But both of you, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I do want you to give a little bit of background about your involvement in each of the parties and how long you've been doing this, and establish your street cred, and then we'll get let the games begin. Uh, so, James, we'll start with you. Talk to us a little bit about your background and political I history. started out as a... Um, intern for Tom Torlakson, then I worked for the state party for a while, and then I went on to do campaign finance for Ed Lee, and now I'm a member of the California delegation for the Democratic Party. And I've done various other volunteer jobs. And campaign management types of roles Camp as well. Yeah, I did a campaign manager for a uh, local school board race and my candidate won. Nice. And so, Sue, give us your background. Well, I've been a Republican all my life since before I could vote. Uh, and I grew up in Ohio, and my first campaign was when I was in high school. All, everything's pretty much been a grassroots experience. Um, but I was a teenage Republican, a college Republican. Took a break for a while while I was raising my kids, but been pretty steady over the last decade here in the Bay Area in the Republican Party. Um, three times elected chairman of Alameda County Republican Party. Last year was elected to what we call the California Republican Party Regional Vice Chair position. Um, in between, I've done campaigns. Catherine Baker, Duff Sunheim for Senate. Um, I even presided over a Republican Women uh, Federated Club. Right. And so would either of you consider yourselves extremists? <laughs> <laughs> This is participatory. You, all right. Shall we go? It's your yeah, turn. Yeah, James, it's your turn. Are you an extremist? <laughs> no, I don't think I'm an extremist. I mean, so would you consider yourself kind of a middle-of-the-road Democrat then? Yeah, I would. Yeah. And for you, Sue? I came of age when uh, the Republican Party was definitely more moderate than some elements are today. Um, and the same thing with the Democrat Party. There was a lot more bipartisan negotiation going on during the 60s mm -hmm. and the 70s and the 80s. Right. And the thing I mean I appreciate about both of you is I know, and I'm, I'm going to out you both, um, I know that you guys have both supported, and when, when the right candidate's there, whether they're on the Republican side or the Democrat side, you're going to go with the best candidate, um, if it makes sense for your, your vote or for what's happening or because there's only one type available. You guys usually do the right thing, right? Of course. So it's not just partisan. So when we're talking about tonight, there might be things that you guys agree about, Mm -hmm. the Trump presidency, even if they're not party line <laughs> perspective um, for either. So let's no let's, commitments, no commitments, <laughs> right? No commitments. So um, talk to us a little bit about oh, we'll start with you, James. Is the Trump presidency what you expected it to be a year in? Um, I'm just fearful for the way people are being treated recently. Uh, People that are U.S. citizens have been mistaken as immigrants, and I think the hatred speech that came out during the rallies and stuff inspired people to treat people that maybe be a different skin color or, you know, different background as, you know, they're not U.S. citizens when they, they are. Some of the people that are being picked on are actual U.S. citizens, okay. and I... I think the the hatred that came out in the rallies really just so the pre-election rallies right okay. has made this made this a problem where people are being picked on that shouldn't be picked on. I mean, they're U.S. citizens. They were born, they weren't born here, but they be, they did their process to become U.S. citizens, mm -hmm. and then that that should be respected. Okay, and so immigration is that the only thing that that is um, a concern for you with the Trump presidency, or is there anything else? I mean, just just the rhetoric that he's, I mean, the tweets and stuff, I mean, he doesn't have the demeanor of a normal president. I've, I've watched Reagan and I've watched other presidents, and this president kind of goes off the deep end sometimes, I mean, okay. with his tweets and stuff, and I think he needs to be a little more reserved. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so 
Sue, how about for you? I mean, for the first year, is Trump living up to what you expected him to live up to? Or were there surprises? What's your set of thoughts? I right think now? he has surpassed my expectations. Okay. I was late. Was that a low bar? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. Um, having been around campaigns and watching elections for as many years as I have, I was extremely nervous about Trump being the candidate for the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not my choice during the primary period. Um, and when it came down to a binary choice between Hillary Clinton or uh, Donald Trump, I, like a lot of Republicans, I came home and I voted for him in the general mm -hmm. election. Um, I did not expect him to win. It was a shock he on election. He didn't expect him to win either. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> Um, and so it suddenly was like throwing open the barn doors. It's like, what happens? You know, all the, you know, everything is out. And um, so it's, he's an unconventional, he was an unconventional candidate. Right. He's an unconventional president. We're in unconventional times compared to my own personal time on this earth. So I don't, I don't predict, I don't know where things are going. Um, but looking back with hindsight over the first year, I'm pleased with a number of things that have taken place. I'm pleased with regulatory rollback. I'm pleased with the tax reform. I'm pleased with a number of the people he's delegated authority to, to run various agencies or different functions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, those things that Sue commented on being pleased by, regulatory mm -hmm. rollbacks, delegation of responsibilities, do you have similar or differing opinions on those aspects? Well, I think rolling back of environmental protections is really bad, and I think uh, just that alone is, you know... Are there particular alone. environmental policies that you object to being rolled back? Yeah, release... I mean, he, he is letting them forest in national parks, you know, sign that bill to where he, they can, you know, take resources from national parks. And also the, the mining, they've been able to insert more pollutants into the water in the rivers. And, I mean, they've showed me pictures of rivers that are turning red from, you know, laxing of regulations. So, I'm seeing movement out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, James. So who is they um, that are showing you? I mean, I get pictures from different groups that take pictures of, you know, the mining industry and they took pictures of the river that was outside the mining industry and it was red water. I mean, to me, that's not a good thing. I mean, water should be blue and pristine and clean and yeah. Well, depending on I mean, where you are. And I mean, if you're, if there's mud running up river, it's sometimes hard to tell what's happening. And so I was just curious as well as to what's, what's the source. And so other things, I mean, delegation, um, of uh, the different roles of placements that he's put into to effect or though any of those of concern uh, for you or those as expected I mean it's what I expected Trump to do you know just uh, I don't think his pick for education was very good Betty DeVos okay yeah. Okay. And so for you, Sue, I mean, immigration, um, are, you're in the heart of the Bay Area, mm -hmm. where it's a pretty diverse area. What are you hearing on the ground as far as uh, the, the, are there persecutions or you know, Mexican restaurants being burnt down? What, I mean, what's happening <laughs> in, in your area of the, I don't the see, Bay Area? I don't see him as a racist. I don't see him as anti-immigration. Um, in fact, what I see is Donald Trump is not, he has no fear. He is willing to take on big projects, mm -hmm. big issues, big topics. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes at it, it seems, like somebody who's negotiating maybe to buy a uh, building site for a big hotel. I don't really know. Right. But he's clearly not as political in his approach. And what I mean by that is worrying about his next election or worrying about the poll numbers or something like that. He's right. willing to just put it out there and say, all right. If we're going to solve this problem, this is what I'd like to see. Okay, other side, Democratic Party, what would you like to see? Right. Um, and I think everybody's a little thrown by this. We don't see this in politics. No, He's they want a, to see dancing yeah, and... Yeah, a lot of nice, you know, you know, and uh, so I think it's refreshing in a way. 
it's again, you can't really predict where it's going most of the time. You just have to wait for it to unfold. But this is why people like him. And uh, they like that kind of authentic, put it out there, right. kind of bluntness, I think, sometimes. But there's a lot of people that it makes uncomfortable. Very nervous. Yeah. And, he, and to your point, I mean, he, he's, there are people who avoid the third rail, meaning electrical current could be running through there, and this guy keeps his tongue on the third rail, yeah. which I think is part of how he keeps his hair as tall as it is, but um, <laughs> the electricity will do that. But, um, I mean, your perspective, do, do you agree that the unpredictability is there? Do, do people on the Democrat side say they like the fact that he's blunt, or does it just scare the living crap it out of them? It scares the living crap out of us. And, and the, way, <laughs> the way the other countries have been reacting to the way he's came off. Okay. Yeah, I want to so, talk about this because yeah. when you talk about national security, there's a, it seems like the Democrat narrative is now we're the laughing stock of the world and no one respects us. And on the Republican side, there's like, you know, they fear us and that's a good thing. Help me understand your perspective. But I mean, with countries that are like us, why would we want to alienate countries that are like us? Like, I mean, a lot of European countries are upset with the way he, his rhetoric's been and, you know, I think he should tone it down a little bit, you know? Okay. Because we want to be respected in the world. So I think that's important that, you know, our morals and our values that the United States has, he's a representative of the United States of America and he should represent us in a way that other countries respect us. Okay. Not fear us, but respect us. Okay. And Sue, your comment on that. <laughs> Well, respect is an interesting word because I think they respect him uh, because he represents the United States. I think they respect him because he's willing to not take anything for granted. He shakes things up a little bit. For example, NATO, most of the other countries, even though for years they were supposed to pull their weight and uh, contribute certain levels of funding for NATO, they didn't. And we just kept carrying them along, sort of like a parent with a child, who, a parent who can't ever say no, just mm. says, okay, you know, I'll give you your allowance even though you didn't make your bed. And, um, but all of a sudden here comes Donald Trump and he says, no, we can't afford to carry NATO at that level any longer. Everybody right. needs to pull their weight. Right. And the others weren't used to that either. And right. they were like, wait a minute, we don't want to have to put any more into NATO funding. Right, and so you're, act you're talking about people doing their fair share? <laughs> That, that seems and like, living up to the letter of the agreement? You're sounding like a Democrat, people doing their fair share and stuff. I don't know. I, <laughs> I mean, so what, is that one of the areas that you're, you're con uh, that is a, an issue or not an issue for you, for NATO and oh, that I, other countries should I, be doing their funding? I agree that everybody should do their fair share in funding, yeah. Okay. So I have no problem with that. That sounds... Uh, and I feel that, uh, for example... Um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is very happy with who's leading the United States right now. Right. You know, um, and then you look at some of the European countries, they're all going through some kind of similar upheaval in their politics. France clearly went through, you know, who it was a very um, uh, partisan, very split election last time around. In, in Britain, they are having their issues after Brexit. And uh, in Poland, they're having issues. And in Hungary, they're having issues. And in Germany, Germany yeah. Angela, Angela Merkel isn't as strong as she was before, and people are upset. So there's a lot of this going on in a lot of different countries. And, and I, 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 I don't think that he has a grasp on the uh, Arab world. I mean, they, they don't see it. The Palestinians feel like he's, you know, by giving Israel you know, the, the capital and everything, that he's looked away from the Palestinians and not given them the respect they deserve. But his reception in Saudi Arabia, where they had the convocation of all of the leaders of all of the Arab nations come to hear him speak and how they treated him and the whole, it was touted as one of his best overseas trips. So again, there's things changing in the Middle East. Well, and the question also is, is are we respected at a citizen level or at a political level, and is there a difference? Because even within our own elections, people, there's, the media was bashing Trump diligently throughout the, the campaign process, and a lot of citizens were bashing him throughout the process. And then people went into the booth 
And they did something unexpected. They voted for him with all the bashing going around and nobody admitted even on the exit polls they were doing it. Mm -hmm. But they smirked and celebrated. Actually, Clinton still won the popular vote. He won the Electoral College. He didn't actually win. So the our, our vote, system so. is set up the way it's set up. Right. And if she would have won the, the electrical, Electoral College, then she would have won, whether he won the popular vote or not. I mean, that's the way you, you establish the rules of the game and then mm -hmm. you play by and those. It isn't the right. only election in recent times where we've had very close elections and so forth. And even Bill Clinton, when he won the first time, didn't win a majority mandate. Right. You know, he won the plurality in a three-way contest, but he never did win over, the, well, he didn't win over 50 percent the first time. Right. So looking at all of these things, and then I, I, there's one more that I want to cover on the international thing before we move on to other parts of the the state of our union uh, and that is in the times that we're in you mentioned being in unconventional times mm -hmm. when you're looking at threats like North Korea and you look at someone like Trump who the world may think he's crazy and he's off his rails or whatever mm -hmm. one of the things that I kind of felt while he was going through and he wasn't my first choice either but that there is a place for someone who knows how to rattle a good saber when you're looking at the world stage, and there are certain lunatics who are all about the saber rattling, Kim Jong, whichever, right. being a, a, a good family of saber rattlers, do you think that there's some value to them going, you know what, he, he might be just a notch crazier than me, maybe I should back off, or is that just asking for trouble? I, it, well, that, I mean, it might scare him, yeah, it might scare him, you know. I liked Reagan's approach to the, because the way he spoke to people and got, you know, and he brought down the wall, that was a good thing. I think the way Trump's doing it, it's much more scarier. We don't even know as citizens whether he's going to hit the button or not because he's just so unpredictable. Right. Which is very scary. I don't that's think, scary. I don't think he's suicidal. I don't think Donald Trump is going to do anything that's going to, he seems to love the American people. He seems to care about us. I don't think that he talks about it a lot. He, he's sensitive to what he thinks rings with a lot of the people in his audience. He's not going to do something that's going to bring uh, destruction upon us. However, He's looked at the last 25 years of all that diplomacy with North Korea. It didn't slow them down an iota, not one bit. Strongly worded emails aren't enough? No. You're <laughs> so with several administrations, both Republican and Democrat, you know, they continued to build their nuclear program. And nothing changed. And we didn't do anything about China helping them either. So, you know, he's now, we don't have the same choices at this point than Ronald Reagan had or Bill Clinton had. A lot of the choices have been removed from the menu because, you know, we're at a point now where, uh, what's his name? Rocket Man, old Rocket Man. <laughs> Is, he's, putting to, he's putting nuclear tipped, um, you know, armaments on ballistic missiles. You know, it's, he's right around the corner. I wasn't sure if you were going with Elon Musk for no. a moment there. Because... <laughs> Maybe Elon Musk can figure this out for us. <laughs> Little Rocket Man, sorry. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, then, so trying to figure out how things like North Korea work. Okay, let's talk about another thing that economy, something that Trump was associated with being from the business side, mm -hmm. happy, unhappy with the economic performance of the country up until now. We'll start with you, Sue. Just because ladies can go first sometimes, even on this show. Well, his first year in office, um, we had several major uh, natural disasters with the hurricanes in Texas and in Florida and then the fires in California. And all of that was a hit on the economy. So, but those things happen, mm -hmm. right? And then we had tax reform. Well, tax reform is unleashing, that and the regulatory reform I was talking about, is unleashing a lot of um, effort on the part of business in the business world. So they're going to reinvest. They're starting to make those investments. They're, they're uh, uh, repatriating, are bringing back <laughs> the money that was overseas. They're giving people raises. I can't remember how many corporations now have announced increases in paychecks or bonuses or... Um, things of that nature, 300, something like that so far, uh, major corporations. So people are feeling it, that they're, they're feeling optimistic right now. And that is a big part of the economy. 
because when businesses feel there's some predictability and optimism, then you know they they invest, they create more jobs, they grow their business. Would you agree or disagree? Well, I, I've watched the economy, and the economy is doing better. But he, at the time, she was talking about you know taking care of the wildfires. She never mentioned Puerto Rico. He had nothing. He didn't want to even send them any aid. Puerto Rico begged for aid, and and the president did not send anything. It is a U.S. territory. You should have took care of that. Okay. I don't see it that way. There were boats waiting for the uh, storms to subside. They have to cross the ocean, the channel, to get over there. Uh, there a lot of aid was sent. Um, they're also negotiating very sensitively a $75 billion bailout for the island of uh, Puerto Rico. It was still ongoing in the uh, Congress because they had done such a poor job of running their own economy and had gotten it so far into debt. So on top of the $75 billion we were going to try to help them uh, secure or create a payment plan or whatever, then came the hurricane. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, I mean, you can always criticize. I think presidents all get criticized over things like natural disasters. What, could it have been done better or something like that? I never saw him hesitate to send aid. Okay. We only have a few minutes left. Cover health care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where, how are you guys feeling? Are you seeing more people with amputations, heads lopped off? Um, <laughs> or is everyone now well? I mean, what are your thoughts in that direction or the way that it, it could go? Well, I spoke about this before. I think we deserve what Congress has for medical, at least. I mean, people want health care for all, but if we don't get that, we at least want what Congress has. Why can't we have 70 Two percent subsidized health care, and they pay twenty eight percent. So why can't we have the same as them? Okay, and so I'm going to let you answer the, uh, about how you feel the state of health care is, and then I've got a, a question for, to respond to that. But go ahead. <laughs> well, I think we, we're moving back in the right direction. It's going to take a while, and I get that when you have half of the economy is receiving health care from some kind of a government program, Medicaid. Medicare, the Veterans Administration, working for Congress, you know, that looks pretty attractive after a while. But um, as James and I were talking about earlier, here, even here in California, I heard the other day that $91 billion unfunded liability to cover health care for public employees who are retirees of the public employee uh, network in California. $91 billion. This is not, there's no money put aside to pay this. Mm -hmm. And so, and that, that was my question is, so what's the solution as far as paying for all this? If we can't afford the ones that we already have, how can we afford more? Um, we've only got a minute left. Right, but I, I, think, I think we should find ways to do preventative medicine. We talked about this in the other room before this came on, that it's costing us so much because people are afraid to go to the doctor because it costs so much. I don't go to the doctor because I'm afraid, you know, oh my God, the premium. So yeah. I avoid going to the doctor, which if something happens to me, it's going to cost me more on the long run. I, so I, we need to find a sensible solution where people aren't afraid to go to the doctors when they have something wrong because right. if they wait, it's going to be so much worse. Yeah, and it's, it is unfortunate. I think we do need to address it. But for me personally, I used to go to the doctor more before the affordable health care made uh, Healthcare unaffordable. I, that, that was just me, but if government gets involved, it gets expensive. And so we are out of time for now, but I do appreciate both of you coming on, that there was no bloodshed, there were no animals oh, injured. We like each other, don't no, we, no. James? And, and I appreciate that about you, but if you guys will hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. Some people think that a meeting of conservatives in Silicon Valley could fit in a small room. In fact, when the Conservative Forum was founded in 2003, we did meet in a small room, a coffee shop in San Jose. It doesn't get more grassroots than this. It may surprise you that there are thousands of people right here in Silicon Valley who share your principles of liberty, free markets, and limited government. Since our humble beginnings in that coffee shop, we've outgrown three meeting halls. From San Jose to Gilroy to Mill Valley, we bring hundreds of people together each month from all over the Bay Area to promote the principles of American liberty. How do we do it? It starts with a stellar lineup of speakers. Speakers like Steve Forbes, 
Senator Jim DeMint, Dr. Victor Davis Hansen, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, Andrew Breitbart, Pamela Geller, and many others. These speakers passionately articulate our shared principles and remind us why conservatism isn't just the smart choice, it's also the moral choice. Our monthly meetings are only one dimension of the forum. We underwrite The Right Side, a monthly television show on cable access channel KMVT. We also host a monthly constitution discussion group and provide tables at our meetings for more than a dozen local groups who share our love of liberty to promote their specific cause. The Conservative Forum is the premier place in Silicon Valley for conservatives to gather, become invigorated, motivated, and empowered. We welcome guests to our monthly meetings and offer special discounted pricing to first-time visitors. Take a look at our speaker lineup in the coming months and join us to learn why we say liberty is made in America. And that was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum, now the Liberty Forum. And we appreciate them tremendously because they've been underwriting the show for now our seventh season. And without them, this wouldn't be possible. We'd have other things to do the first Tuesday of the month when uh, taping. But what they're best known for is what they do second Tuesday of each month, and that is their speaker series. It happens at 7 o'clock at the IFES Portuguese Hall, just three minutes from here at 432 Stirling Road in Mountain View. In March, Ann Coulter will be the speaker. She's an author, a columnist, and Hellraiser if you're uh, from Berkeley or other places that attend liberal. Uh, in April, Charles C.W. Cook, editor of National Review Online, will be uh, at the forum. And in May, Lawrence J. McQuillan, senior fellow and director of the Center on Entrepreneurial Innovation at the Independent Institute, will be at the forum. For more information, you can go to cfsv.com, theconservativeforum.com, or you can also uh, Google the Liberty Forum and find more information about speakers, times, etc. there. In closing this evening, it is refreshing to be able to hear all sides of the spectrum uh, politically as far as Democrat and Republican uh, go, but in a way that is not argumentative and is respectful and is so much less like Facebook and the firebombs that explode over there. I do encourage you to talk with people, even from other parts of the political spectrum, about your feelings, about your concerns, and ask likewise from them. You may find that you have more in common than divides you. And that's always our goal here on the right side. And so we thank you for joining us this evening, for getting to see fair and balanced uh, reporting on what's going on one year into the Trump presidency. And we do look forward to seeing you either on the show or in person sometime soon. I've been your host, Chris Pareja, and I look forward to hearing from you either at one of those venues or if you just can't wait, reach out to us at therightsidetv at gmail.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks again and have a great night.